Hello, Antifa. <laughs> it's me, Ghazi, the commander in chief of the Black Hammer Organization. I heard you had some not so nice things to say about me. I heard you had so nice things to say about my hammers. Mm. Beyonce fan? You probably are if you're a black member of the audience. Since the 1990s, her career first with the group Destiny's Child and then solo has been iconic to the black community. In so much as we have royalty, she is it, alongside the Obamas. No one else could gain comparable status. In the modern day, it's doubtful whether that kind of fever that Beyonce inspires is even possible for another artist to obtain. Many have fought for that crown and none have been successful. But recently there's been a break, a shift in the tide. Let me tell you a story. In early December, last year as of recording, Beyonce released a film titled Renaissance, about her tour by the same name. When it was announced this film would play in Tel Aviv, Israel, fans had a multitude of reactions, while many begged the star not to allow her film to play in Israel while Gaza is being bombed during an active genocide. Some rallied to her defense, like bees defending their queen, Lamenting why black celebrities are expected to say anything, and why we should care about people that have nothing to do with us, quote unquote, or hold black celebrities to standards that white ones aren't held to, never mind the fact that Taylor Swift, the white equal to Beyonce in fame, not talent, is facing similar backlash. Some went as far as to claim that she couldn't say anything, which is blatantly untrue. A billionaire with her own label, Beyonce is more equipped than almost any other artist to speak on the issue and have significant impact with her voice. No one is forcing her to be silent, and even if they were, it would be a massive dent to her integrity not to attempt to speak out anyway. But why do people expect Beyonce of all people to speak on this issue in the first place? Well, it may be that for many, she has at least seemed like a figure of black liberation, at least to the politically unaware. Beyonce has intentionally cultivated an image of herself as the patron saint of black capitalism and black capitalists, as has her husband Jay-Z. Although he would tell you being called a capitalist is a slur, but what is even liberatory about her? Figures like Beyonce and other large black celebrities serve the systems in power around us. She has always pushed an image and narrative of black success under capitalism and black quote unquote excellence that has encouraged faith in a system that does not serve to liberate anyone and only reinforces it. Black bourgeois figures like herself are not for the liberation of black people per se, but the right of black capitalists to also exploit, and in some cases the right to be the sole exploiters of the black community. To this end, the black bourgeoisie skillfully co-ops the image of black liberation and the image of our radical tradition to push their own narratives. We've seen examples of something similar from non-black people. All of us are aware of the appropriation of Martin Luther King by right-wing racists to shame black communities that don't meet their standards or behave in ways that are too disruptive to the system. The same people who killed him are honoring him on Twitter or shaming us for not being like the appropriated image of him they created. Quote, Beyonce does stand for something for a particular strain of racial capitalism that is concerned mostly with selling the aesthetics of black liberation for mass consumption. There's a lot of money to be made in satisfying white mainstream fantasies of safe liberation, even if, perhaps especially if, those fantasies defang movements for actual freedom and justice and preserve the status quo. The facets of this liberal fantasy include black firstism or being tapped by white owned brands to be the first black person to do a thing. This was played up when Beyonce was the first black woman to headline Coachella, and when she was featured by Tiffany as the first black woman to wear its famed yellow diamond, a rock sourced during the bloody era of British colonialism in South Africa. The liberal fantasy of progress requires performances that borrow from the aesthetics of black and LGBTQ liberation. This allows black people to make millions off organizations with a history of anti-blackness, such as the National Football League, or from colonial entities such as Tiffany. In the case of Beyonce, it allows her to quote Malcolm X on black American women's dehumanization while saying absolutely nothing about the terrifying dehumanization of Palestinians. It allows her to make a song titled America Has a Problem, yet say nothing about the role of the United States in bombing Palestinians to bits." End quote. Another example could be AOC discussing the Black Panthers' food programs as if they're part of some liberal tradition of community aid, and leaving out their politics and the role the government she works for and is part of played in their murder and jailings. 
upholding their image while not once advocating for the release of still living former Panthers in jail. Beyonce's 2016 Super Bowl performance saw her literally wearing a sexualized cheerleader cosplay of the Black Panthers, blonde wig, berets, and all. In her hands, a legacy is made meaningless. She is literally the arbiter of white capitalism absorbing the Black radical tradition and warping it into something meaningless. Beyonce and AOC are both part of a liberal capitalist tradition of appropriating the image of figures and movements that would have fiercely disagreed with their actions and ideas, conveniently leaving out anywhere they would have disagreed. Black capitalism has been debated against for years by radicals, and these exact conversations can be seen playing out in the old debate footage from decades before. The image, not actual figures, but the image of them, is basically a commodity, a form of social capital, in the way that having a black friend is used as an excuse or magic fetish that creates a racismless void to non-black people. Appropriating radical black figures for whatever one's political needs may be allows one to signal that they have the only truly correct politics. The black radical tradition is a cabinet full of Jesus figures, at times so deeply divorced from their actual politics as to be unrecognizable. MLK is appropriated by anti-communist conservative Christians who pretend he shared their ideology even though he was a self-proclaimed socialist. His name is used to justify racist policies such as ending affirmative action and to claim he would be against it when he spoke loudly about the need for those specific kinds of policies. Black people also do this too. There are hordes of black cis men who uplift the image of the Panthers, but also have views on women's liberation that would make Phyllis Schlafly raise the black and purple in protest. Men who catcall and sexually harass women but uphold the image of a party that was feminist largely run by and sustained by women, and who would literally kill their male members who acted in sexually predatory ways. The conversation about misogyny in the Panthers is a long one that they themselves were having and adjusted for. Misogynistic men upholding the image of the Panthers, Asada Shakur and Fred Hampton, are no better than white conservatives appropriating MLK. For prime example, Jonathan Majors used the image of Coretta Scott King to abuse his girlfriend and hold her to an absurd standard, a trend that didn't start with him. That particular aspect of the black radical tradition has long been weaponized against women. Miss King herself is flattened, her own activism and legacy turned into nothing more than a doting wife, silently and uncritically supporting everything her husband does. Many of these men can't even name or explain the ideology of the Panthers. They have no understanding of Marxism, Leninism, Communalism, Anti-Fascism, Anti-Imperialism, or Colonialism. Yet they wield the image of people who frankly would be so deeply ideologically opposed to them they might have just shot them. This fetishization both disrespects these figures and disrupts our ability to accurately discuss, learn from, and criticize the movements these figures come from. There is also something relevant to be said here about the concept of black excellence, as itself an extension of black capitalism. I hardly would be the first to say it, but that attitude is actually quite toxic, and it's something Beyonce and celebrities like her are known for. Black excellence as an attitude reframes complacency and compliance as something revolutionary and recaptures radical pro-black sentiments in ways palatable to capitalists. I remember this attitude being pushed on me by my own family. I walked around with an understanding that because of my blackness I would be looked down on, I would be seen as and still am seen as hyper-aggressive, less intelligent, etc. And because of this I always had to be the best in the room. The best dressed, the most well-spoken, the most obedient, the most intelligent to an extent that was damaging to my mental health. Even now, I struggle with having a hyper-competitive attitude and being hyper-aware of how I'm being perceived by people. The entire goal of black excellence is to be so palatable and impressive to non-black people, and so excellent at playing the game the system puts us in, that racism no longer affects us. To become immune to being negrified or stereotyped. It is a product of the obsessive self-examination and fear of appearing a certain way that defines double consciousness. Franz Fanon discusses these behaviors in his works Wretched of the Earth and in Black Skin White Masks. In both, he discusses the psychology of colonized people and how the conditions of colonization led them to want to bury their indigeneity in favor of assimilation as both a coping mechanism and a necessary means to survival. One particular point he articulates extensively in the latter text is how harshly black people are judged when in the same positions as white people, how black people are meant to represent their entire race and how they succeed or fail and how they fit or disprove stereotypes. Quote, Negroes are savages, morons, and illiterates. But I knew personally that in my case these assertions were wrong. There was this myth of the Negro that had to be destroyed at all costs. We were no longer living in an age when people marveled at a black priest. We had doctors, teachers, and statesmen. Okay, but there was always something unusual about them. We have a Senegalese history teacher. He's very intelligent. 
Our physician's black, he's very gentle. Here was the Negro teacher, the Negro physician. As for me, I was becoming a nervous wreck, shaking at the slightest alert. I knew, for instance, that if the physician made one false move, it was over for him and all those who came after him. What, in fact, could one expect from a Negro physician? As long as everything was going smoothly, he was praised to the heavens. But watch out, there was no room whatsoever for any mistake. The black physician will never know how close he is to being discredited. I repeat, I was walled in. Neither my refined manners, nor my literary knowledge, nor my understanding of the quantum theory could find favor." End quote. As mentioned before, this paranoia and strain at needing to be perfect and professional comes from a real and rational fear. At its most base and blunt, it is literally an attempt to avoid death, whether social or literal. Being misunderstood as aggressive as a black person can be a deadly affair. But the question Fanon asks, and that the people continue to grapple with, is whether or not it's even worth it to do so. Making oneself obsessed with palatability guarantees nothing. Graveyards can be filled with the bodies of respectable, polite, well-dressed black folk who spoke carefully and followed the rules and still couldn't outrun their melanin in their skin cells. I think about discussions of protests needing to be respectable and convenient to win over popular support, and I feel frustration because that has never mattered. MLK was peaceful and he was killed for it. Being respectable and polite did not save men like Philando Castile or Elijah McClain. The effort to outrun racism with assimilation is a fruitless one. No matter how nice the protest, they will still send the cops to disperse it. Never mind the fact that a protest is supposed to be disruptive to what you are protesting, or it's literally not a protest. But the assimilationist concept of respectability still haunts us. Black excellence still, noose-like, holds us up to often impossible and arbitrary standards that keep us from pushing for something more radical than black bootstrapisms. The underlying message behind this train of thought is that black people who are exceptional should not experience discrimination and racism. We saw a similar narrative following the killing of 23-year-old Elijah McClain at the hands of Aurora, Colorado police. Following the murder of George Floyd, McClain's story gained greater visibility on social media. Many demanded the arrest of the officers involved. McLean was repeatedly described as a kind and gentle person who spent time at shelters caring for animals. The emphasis again was that a black person who exhibits these positive traits does not deserve to be harmed. This narrative is problematic because it reinforces a notion that a black person who has engaged in a wrongdoing or crime does not deserve humanity. It propagates the idea that black people are only deserving of humanity if they are exceptional, charitable do-gooders. Under this belief, a black person who has made mistakes is irredeemable." End quote. We have to stop allowing capitalists to frame black capitulation and obedience to the system as excellence, and that excellence as revolutionary. And we especially need to stop letting celebrity capitalist billionaires encourage these attitudes because they're black. The black radical tradition is not a coherent narrative. Although many people fought for black liberation as they understood it, that does not make them liberators inherently. Barack Obama may be placed in the same historical canon as figures like Hampton, Shakur, and King by liberals, but that does not make him actually liberatory or even allied with those who are. They would be opposed. Just because one claims to be pro-black does not mean they manifest a positive radical vision of what that even means, or that their actions are liberatory. The image of the Panthers is one oft appropriated, not just by Beyonce. These appropriations often can have more sinister outcomes than just the banal evils of capitalism. The organization Black Hammer was a radical organization, quote unquote, whose hope was to be yet another claimant to the empty throne the original Panthers left behind. Those familiar may remember the recent charges brought against former leader Augustus C. Romain, aka Ghazi Kodzo. The group first formed in 2019 and was made up of black radicals from various black radical organizations. Initially, it was just another unremarkable black liberationist group. But according to some who were members, things took a turn when Ghazi became a prominent member. Ghazi got his radical political start after a stint on YouTube with Joe Waller, also known as Omali Yeshitela, as his mentor in the APSP, who recruited him to the party. The African People's Socialist Party was also doomed to be declared a cult. Ghazi was a founding member of Black Hammer, and its formation was credited as his idea in a statement put out by former members calling for its dissolution. Quote, 
Augustus presented the idea of forming Black Hammer to me while we were staying at my mother's home in November of 2018. This was after he exposed to me the very true nature of the APSP during their Congress, quote unquote, and as Secretary General, he had first-hand knowledge of everything that was going on. When the Congress was over and we returned to the APSP's headquarters in St. Pete, Florida, it was then that he convinced me that we should leave. I think it can be accurately assessed that the creation of Black Hammer was driven by Augustus's need for livelihood in addition to building an organization that would sustain himself. Augustus could not return home to Stone Mountain, Georgia to live with his mom, and abandoning his secretary general position within the APSP meant that he'd have no financial resources either. His findings about the APSP stand on their own, and it's even more important to understand that from every video that was used to expose the APSP, to even the Black Hammer launch party, which was promoted as Ghazi's launch party, was used to shore up his supporters and followers. This is evident as he made each contradiction revolve around him as an individual. It is also evident in Black Hammer's methods of work, as all interactions are solely based in petty spats instigated by Augustus, then in turn, the organization is mobilized for his defense as these individuals are deemed his enemies. My arguments to first establish a constitution and an organizational manual for Black Hammer in the developing stages were berated by Augustus as me not putting in enough effort to build Black Hammer. His solution was to take the constitution and organizational manual of the APSP and any other manual that he still has access to and simply change every mention of APSP to Black Hammer. Even though we professed that Black Hammer would never be another APSP, there was no way to see that we were essentially doing just that. Ghazi quickly turned the organization into an engine of power accumulation and abuse. He created a complex cultic system of information gathering on his comrades, using fake therapists who reported back to him, quote unquote, healing slash sharing circles, to gain information on his members, which he would then use to abuse them or manipulate them more effectively. Self-criticism sessions were also used as opportunities to abuse, Members were not allowed to have any privacy or boundaries respected. The details of sexual relationships and preferences, traumas, and more were forcibly revealed at Romaine's command. On top of this, he used more traditional cultic methods to isolate and control his victims. Members were guilt-tripped into working to the point of burnout and suicidal ideation. All were held up to an impossible standard of a perfect revolutionary who is solely dedicated to the party and works unquestioningly for it. Elections within the organization were almost always rigged by various means, with Ghazi either appointing people to elected positions without elections, stalling them for months on end, or forcing votes at the end of eight hour plus long meetings so people were too exhausted to continue dissenting. Anyone who took issue to the various idiosyncrasies of the organization's functions could expect themselves removed from power within two weeks or less, or subject to the many purges Ghazi had the organization undergo. These served as pretense for him to eject disobedient or dissenting members via accusations of being feds, false rape and pedophilia claims, and other methods. Members would eventually go on record admitting that claims against specific individuals were false when they left and disavowed the organization. Ghazi was also intentional about recruiting among young unhoused people who had little protections or options but his abuse. While an abusive and exploitative culture sizzled under the surface, Ghazi's online presence and the hammers alongside him grew increasingly unhinged, mimetic, and anti-Semitic. The party would form alliances with Proud Boy Gavin McGinnis and host podcasts with him, as well as push the line of mainstream conservatism, becoming anti-CRT and anti-trans over time as well. Quote, Black Hammer Party is conservative through and through. We do not accept groomers, whether trans, gay, or whatever. Critical race theory is an abomination and teaches children they must hate themselves based on their race. We believe in the Second Amendment. Hashtag MAGA communism. Ghazi's Joker mask ramblings, Holocaust denial, and vitriol against anti-fascists were well documented and ridiculed. Under the guise of collecting reparations, Ghazi stole thousands from well-meaning people in order to fill his own pockets. In 2020, the organization began collecting donations for a project called Hammer City. They made over 60,000 in donations and announced on May 3rd, 2021 that they had used it to liberate, quote unquote, a plot of land in Beaver Pines, Colorado. Hammer City was short-lived, however. The group never actually signed the documents necessary to finalize the purchase, and when the deadline passed, they were evicted and escorted off the land by sheriffs for squatting. They were gone by May 15th. Everyone on Twitter predictably and rightly laughed at the ridiculous organization. The Hammer's ridiculous online personas allowed the outcome of the organization to blindside some. 
The Hammers ended up renting a home in Fayetteville, Georgia, where they would face their downfall. Ghazi's abuse had escalated to the point that some members alleged forced labor, sexual abuse, beatings, and more. An anonymous call from inside the home on July 19, 2022 would draw SWAT teams. Someone had called anonymously to report they were being held against their will. Ghazi was arrested alongside Xavier Russian and charged for false imprisonment, kidnapping, conspiracy, sodomy, aggravated assault, and gang activity. Later on in April of 2023, he would face additional charges when it was confirmed his organization had taken money from a Russian agent named Alexander Viktorovich Ionov to further Russian state agendas in the US. From at least November 2014 until July 2022, Ionov allegedly engaged in a years-long foreign malign influence campaign targeting the United States. As a part of the campaign, Ionov allegedly recruited members of political groups within the United States, including the African People's Socialist Party in the Uhuru Movement, the APSP in Florida, Black Hammer in Georgia, and a political group in California referred to in the superseding indictment as U.S. Political Group 3 to participate in the influence campaign and act as agents of Russia in the United States, including the following indicted defendants. Omali Yeshitala, a U.S. citizen residing in Petersburg, Florida, and St. Louis, Missouri, who served as the chairman and founder of the APSP. Penny Johan Hess, a U.S. citizen residing in St. Petersburg, Florida, and St. Louis, Missouri, who served as the leader of a component of the APSP. Jesse Novell, a U.S. citizen residing in St. Petersburg, Florida, and St. Louis, Missouri, who served as a member of a component of the APSP. And Augustus C. Romaine Jr., a.k.a. Ghazi Kodzo, a U.S. citizen residing in St. Petersburg, Florida, and Atlanta, who served as a leader of the APSB and a founder of Black Hammer in Georgia. One focus of Ionov's alleged influence operation was to create the appearance of American popular support for Russia's annexation of territories in Ukraine. For example, in May 2020, Ionov allegedly sent a request he stated was from Russia, the Donetsk People's Republic, an apparent reference to a Russian-occupied region in eastern Ukraine to Yeshitela and members of other U.S. political groups to make statements in support of the independence of the so-called Donetsk People's Republic, a Russian-backed breakaway state in eastern Ukraine. Ionov later allegedly touted to the FSB that Yeshitela's video-recorded statement of support was the first time an American nonprofit organization congratulated citizens of the occupied region." End quote. The Hammers were a prime example of the appropriation of black radical imagery for anti-radical causes. They talked and dressed like Black Panthers, all while being intensely anti-communist, anti-Marxist, anti-Semitic, queerphobic, and fascist sympathizers. They appropriated a familiar image all while creating nothing liberatory and acting as an engine of physical and sexual abuse. A cult. As the former leaders of BHO and people who set out to be honest revolutionaries, we cannot ignore the crimes we committed in giving this new breed of pig a platform and allowing ourselves to be used in the subjugation of our people. Leaders of the Black Hammer organization were weaponized in petty internet squabbles, berating black women, tearing down our political prisoners like Kevin Rashid Johnson, Pan-Africanists, and indigenous organizers. Even though we said the colonizer was our enemy, only our brothers, sisters, and siblings received this kind of smoke. We were making enemies of those who by any measure should have been our allies. Divide and conquer is the oldest colonial trick in the book, and we, as steeped in revolutionary science as we are, fell for it hook, line, and sinker. Externally, all Black Hammer allies would inevitably be petty bourgeois sellouts that deserved the worst animosity. Internally, the Black Hammer leaders either stood idly or actively participated as Augustus would verbally abuse his comrades under the guise of criticism. How stupid could we have been to think that we were building a cadre? We were building lackeys. The Black Hammer leaders were part of rigged meetings, devoid of principle, under a mockery of so-called democratic centralism in which dissent was isolated and bright comrades whose ideas could have saved so many of our people were thrown away. For what? Hammer f***ing city. This digital neocolonialist Jonestown. But instead of a city, Augustus had to settle for a house. A house overriding with violence of a physical, physiological, and sexual nature. In this capitalist crisis, while the bourgeois is at each other's throats, in a time so ripe for revolution, we, the undersigned, have committed a crime that could be beyond self-criticism. We have unwittingly aided the white power state by dividing and alienating the people through outright goofy and disturbing shit. By helping create an organization that acts as a knife, not in the throats of our enemy, but in the backs of our friends. Malcolm X said we cannot begin the healing process by a partial removal of the knife. It must be removed. Black Hammer must be dissolved.
So what next? Divestment from celebrity culture is an essential step in solving this issue. We all probably saw that joke tweet that went like, what if we just ignored famous people? But we literally should. The deification that comes with celebrity status, that comes with having and being a fan or a stan is blinding. It causes people to be unable to critically examine the figures affecting their lives. An essential ingredient in the complacency of American voters and political stagnation in this country is the celebrity status we give political figures and let them enjoy that allows them to easily get away with giving people nothing. It keeps a cadre of uncritical supporters and reply guys who intervene and defend their favorite famous people from valid criticism. On top of that, we should not need any celebrity to share our opinions on anything in order to feel validated in it, which is what this feels like people are wanting at times. Whether it's Black Hammer or Beyonce, anyone using the image of black radicalism to push their own empty politics must be deeply scrutinized with honest eyes. Additionally, I think it's important to abandon the culture of hero worship when it comes to past radical figures. We should be much more careful about absorbing the theoretical and practical aspects of these figures, not just their appropriated image. Divorcing ourselves from their reputations and mystique and focusing more on what's actually to be learned in terms of theory. Enough rad libs wearing Malcolm X or Black Panther t-shirts as if that's radicalism or signals to coherent politics. Rad libs love the image. Radicals use the theory. Having an inflated fanboy-like obsession with the figures themselves is a step that makes their appropriation possible in the first place. All of these famous figures made mistakes or did things wrong. Again, looking supremely at the Panthers, many of them discussed after the fact the organization's internal misogyny issue, discussed how the organization's centralization caused some dissonance between local chapters and national leaders, an issue we saw repeat itself with the Black Lives Matter organization. Recuperation and appropriation relies on us not having these more complex criticisms of the movements and figures we uplift and remember, so we won't think critically about those who use that imagery either. So be more responsible. Kill your heroes, abolish fan culture, everyone is fallible. Be skeptical of everyone, including me, including yourself. This isn't really an issue that can be solved with gatekeeping. You can't effectively police it, but you can keep yourself informed and say something when we see this happening. Resisting the defanging of radical people in politics is vitally important. The black radical tradition is not this holy monolith of figures who were all perfect and all thought the same. We have to interrogate ourselves for the tendency to hero worship. In making this video, I also came across the video testimonies of former members of Black Hammer. And in lieu of using those testimonies in this video, I want to link that resource for the rest of the audience and encourage you to look through it and especially include a checklist the former members and victims of Black Hammer made. Thank you for giving this video a watch. Uh, as I was stating before, all the resources I was mentioning are going to be linked in the description. So if you're curious about more of the statements from people who were directly involved in Black Hammer, you can find those there. In the meantime, happy Black History Month. Thank you for watching this video. If you want to support Black creators during Black History Month, you can do that on my Patreon, where I post a lot of video scripts, short stories, and other things that I write. Um, in the meantime, I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you for watching. Thank you.